Hello everybody. Good morning Stanford. Good morning Stuttgart. My name is Wolfram Ressel. I'm the rector of the University of Stuttgart and I would like to send my kindest digital regards and welcome to you all watching from Stuttgart, Stanford or elsewhere today. I'm delighted to host the first virtual edition of Excellence in Dialogue together with our two clusters of excellence. And I am more than honored to welcome our guest, Professor Margot Gerritsen from the Department of Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford University. Professor Gerritsen is a distinguished expert in the fields of computer simulation and mathematical analysis of engineering and natural processes. Today, we will learn from her about academic adventures in her outstanding career and about the changes in computational science and education she has witnessed. Good morning, Margot. It's around nine o'clock in the morning in Stanford now and six o'clock in the evening over here. There's no less than a nine hours time shift between us. Yet, this did not prevent us from launching this event together. I am very excited that you are on board and thank you very much that you inspired us to make this event as interactive and lively as possible. As you all might guess, Excellence in Dialogue was originally meant to be an on-site event in our Audimax lecture hall. And I can tell you that I truly miss a bursting applause for our guest. And Margot, of course, I would have been an honor to welcome you in person. But as we all know, things have changed. Changed indeed. There is much to be done to fight the pandemic and prevent further harm. Yet, in the middle of the struggle, we might have already learned some lessons. The first lesson is small contributions count. And the second lesson is change brings about new solutions. In this spirit, hosting a cross-Atlantic event without crossing the ocean might actually be worth considering it might be one of many small contributions to ensure our climate health. Of course, virtual meetings cannot replace international mobility and personal encounters with all the intellectual and cultural benefits. However, by using a virtual or hybrid format, we can still enrich our global dialogue and, at the same time, reduce our university's carbon footprint. On this, I have agreed with my two co-hosts, Thomas Ertl and Achim Menges, from our two clusters of excellence, our group of forefront researchers. Again, thank you everybody for being here. I wish you an inspiring first excellence in dialogue and thank you very much, Rainer Helmig, for leading us through the event. I would now like to virtually hand over the microphone to you. Thanks a lot, Wolfram, for these very kind and uh, helpful explanations and uh, the welcome words from your side. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this new format to Excellence in Dialogue. And um, I am a professor for hydromechanics and modeling of hydro systems here at the University of Stuttgart. And I'm also a member of the board of the uh, board of directors of the cluster of excellence of simulation to, uh, technology. And today, I'm very pleased to guide you to this very new format. And this will be really an interactive format. We need you, we need your help so that we get really an interaction with Margot Garrison from Stanford and the members of the university. And of course, it's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker and discussion partner, Professor Margot Garrison from the Stanford University from the other side of the ocean. <laughs> Good morning, Margot. I will come back to you in a second. Before we start to talk to my good friend and research partner, Margot Gelsen from Stanford, I will explain you a little bit more how we can be you integrated in, in this kind of format. It will be interactive, I mentioned it to you. Means you are very important a part of this dialogue. 
The question is how we can integrate you. The first one is you can ask questions to our speakers and um, ManyMeter Interact will alt alternative. That's very important. You are welcome to suggest questions all the time. Please don't be disappointed if we cannot answer all of them. We try to do our best. And that is the first time for us, and especially for me in the studio here. So try to be a little bit patient. Okay. Now I come to the technical part. And uh, you see here the, the gray menu bar at the top of the screen. On the left, you see these four arrows, and uh, you can use them to switch to the full screen. But if you are interested on the full, full screen, then please uh, put the button from the YouTube channel. Then you get the full screen. The next one is very important for you and for us too. That is the ask icon. Questions to our speaker. And if it works, uh, we will translate this directly from German in English. Then there is an icon, the chat, where you can communicate with us. Very important. And then we have an icon, it's brand new, uh, uh, developed by a startup uh, for translations. And we hope it works. Uh, it works for English, it works for Spanish, but we cannot guarantee that it works for German. We try to do our best, okay? <laughs> then, of course, we have an icon for the menu bar for emojis. You can use all these emojis every time. And last not least, if you have any kind of problems, please let us know. Use the button help. Okay? Now, let us come to the event. Okay? I hope you have got now the impression how you can communicate with us. And now we have learned all these options and the technical options. And uh, in addition to the rector, and uh, Wolfram has mentioned this, um, and the university management, uh, this event is organized by the two center of excellences at our university. And um, they are top research alliance funded by the federal and the state government as a part of the German excellence strategy. At this point, I would like to hand over the microphone to uh, the two speakers, spokespersons, of the two center of excellence at first Thomas Ertel for simulation technology followed by Achim Menges from INT CDC. I've always troubled to pronounce this INT CDC uh, correctly. The floor is yours. Dear Professor Gerritsen, also a warm welcome from my side and hello to all joining us today experiencing excellence in dialogue. This event series was actually born during the very first funding period of our Cluster of Excellence EX3310 in simulation technology, the predecessor of today's SimTech cluster. The initial idea was to conclude the winter semester with a colloquium talk which reaches out beyond everyday simulation science and reflects on more general aspects of academic excellence. This excellence in dialogue format turned out to be very successful and attracted very prestigious speakers over the years. After a little time out, and now with two clusters of excellence at the University of Stuttgart, we continue in a larger and more international setting as part of our own excellence strategy. If this were a real in-person event, I would glance out at you in a crowded lecture hall, and I would express my gratitude that so many of you joined us for this lecture. However, this is a pre-recorded welcome speech for a virtual event, recorded as you can see in the background at the Visualization Research Center of the University of Stuttgart. So I only can promise you that I will talk to all of you later about this great event. We are grateful that Margot Garrison accepted our invitation for a new round in Excellence in Dialogue. She is an internationally renowned scientist in the fields of renewable and fossil energy production, as well as in computational mathematics, including search algorithms design and matrix computations. She also deeply cares about women in science, and particularly for women in the computational sciences and other STEM disciplines. 
Both topics are not only of great relevance for the two excellence clusters, but also for the University of Stuttgart in general. And for those reasons, we are very happy that Margot has agreed to become a member of the Simtech Scientific Advisory Board. Simtech is a platform where junior and senior researchers from different disciplines, but also from different cultural and societal backgrounds, come together to conduct research in the field of simulation science, one of the challenging interdisciplinary research areas in contemporary science and engineering and with a fundamental impact on many aspects of human life. The methods which result from our research offer solutions for a variety of applications with huge economic and scientific impact. Already back in 2007, the cluster of excellent simulation technology has taken on this topic from an engineering perspective, and we can now look back to more than 10 successful years. Simtech has advanced simulation science in great depth and breadth based on models, methods, and computing. With its interdisciplinary and methodological profile, it has established itself as an internationally visible research center. Since 2019 and now in the context of the new EEXC 2075, we are able to advance this research into a new direction, which is data-integrated simulation science. By addressing a variety of new focus challenges, we strive to establish a new research paradigm at the crossroads of simulation science and data science. We are looking back on more than a decade of experience in motivating people from different disciplines and backgrounds to work together in a way that is inspiring and absorbing. Even so, we increased the diversity in our cluster over the years. We know that there's still a lot to do. This is a challenge that we take on also in collaboration with our fellow researchers from the Cluster of Excellence in CDC. And I'm happy to hand over now to the spokesperson of NCDC, Professor Achim Mengis. Dear Margot, we are very much looking forward to your talk, which is planned to involve the audience. Such opportunities for dialogue and exchange are very much needed in times of a global pandemic. Thank you. Hello, Margot. Hello, everybody. My name is Achim Menges, and I'm sending you our best regards from the Class of Excellence Integrative Computation Design and Construction in Architecture. Dear Margot, I was very glad to hear some weeks ago that today you will talk about your adventures in science and academia. This is exactly what I'm truly missing during the pandemic, to be together and talk about personal stories and reflect about the way science is evolving. These are the inspirational sources and resources from which we all, especially our students, profit. Also, I think this is not only very interesting for the STEM field, but brings all of us together and builds bridges between the disciplines. At our Cluster of Excellence, we try to do exactly this. We are many scientists from various fields, ranging from architecture, civil and mechanical engineering, robotics and computer science, to the humanities and social science. And what brings us together is our shared mission to find new solutions to design and construction in architecture. Why do we do this? Well, because the building industry is of major importance, ecologically, economically, socially, and culturally. It is one of the largest growing sectors in the world, but at the same time, it is already responsible for approximately 40% of global research consumption, 40% of energy use, and even 50% of global waste production. From a sustainability point of view, it is very evident that we have to rethink the way we design and construct buildings. Therefore, we are very grateful that the German Research Foundation entrusted us with generous funding to help explore new ways. We share the goal with you, Mago, to improve our mathematical and computational models to include the full picture of social, environmental, and technical aspects. We are in the middle of a digital transformation that also concerns architecture and shapes new relations between the various human stakeholders and digital technologies they employ. Based on co-design as a fundamental methodology, we try to contribute by developing feedback-driven approaches to design and engineering methods, fabrication and construction processes, 
as well as material building systems, which we hope will enable a high quality and sustainable architecture and thus a truly future-proof built environment. But joining forces in research may not be enough. Inviting a dialogue is essential to keep up with the global transformation and it is key to achieving an impact together. I think it is very generous and kind of you, Mago, to hold an interactive dialogue with our entire university and share your thoughts and experiences with us. Thank you very much for this inspiration. start with uh, uh, the doctor degree uh, uh, in Stanford. She got the doctor degree in science, scientific computing and computational mathematics in Stanford. Then she has decided, Ma, let us go to the other side of the world, to the <laughs> Department of Engineering and Science in Auckland, New Zealand. And after a while, she has decided New Zealand is beautiful, but uh, California is a little bit nicer. She went back to Stanford and she has started as a professor there, as first as an assistant professor. And uh, now she is a professor in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering. She's a co-founder and co-director of Women in Data Science. She will come back to this later on, I'm 100% sure. Chair of the Board of Society of SIAM, Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And I think that was the first meeting that we have had 25 years ago or so on. And, um, uh, that is really an inside uh, information. She's an extremely good driver. We have had a very nice tour with a Beetle <laughs> long time ago with more than five, six people in the car, and that was not corona conform. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, let us welcome uh, Margot with a nice applause. And you know how it works now to use the remotes. Please do it if you like it. Well, thank you very much, Rainer. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and um, Margot, I got a few emails about your title, okay? And can you explain a little bit more about what is the meaning of your title? And if you like it, please pronounce this as good as possible in a Dutch <laughs> language. It sounds prachtig allemachtig. <laughs> well, first, uh, it's, it's pronounced Nou breekt mijn klomp. And a clomp is uh, this traditional wooden shoe. And a little bit later in my presentation, I actually have some photos. And I have a photo that proves that I actually wore those things <laughs> at any one time. My dad used to wear them all the time in the garden. They're great for gardening in clay. Uh, and so now break my clomp means something happened that makes your wooden shoe break into pieces. Can so something understand. astounding, something uh, crazy and uh, when I reflect back on the 40 years or so that I've been in in STEM that happened to me many times. And, and Margot, I have a very sorry my first unfair question to you. You have a <laughs> very nice uh, supporter in your background. What is the meaning of this very nice supporter in the background? Uh, well first let me point here you see my finger that you know I put this picture of Europe and, and, uh, and Africa just to make sure that you see Germany and, and of course the Netherlands where I'm from. And mm -hmm. next to me here is my lovely assistant. She is actually a mannequin that I use for my sewing projects. But her name is Wilma. She goes everywhere with me. <laughs> and uh, today she's wearing the WITS uh, t-shirt, the Women in Data Science t-shirt. Okay. Um, sorry, one explanation for the audience. Uh, she has mentioned STEM, that stands for Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's the same that uh, the same meaning for us for mint. Uh, I think they have similar problems in the United States and California that we have to integrate really women in science. But we will come back to this later on. Absolutely. Uh, we have asked for questions in advance, and um, we have collected this a little bit. And four of our very good students they have tried to uh, formulate these questions in a little bit more nicer way. And let us start at first with these questions uh, to see what is the tendency and how we can bridge the gap between California and one of the nicest parts of Germany, uh, Baden-Württemberg. <laughs> yeah. 
Hello, Margot. You've been teaching in STEM for 35 years now. My questions for you are, what changes or developments have you seen in engineering education and in engineering students over time? What hopes or fears do you have for the future? Hi, Margot. Uh, as I've understood, you've been working in data science as well as in numerical modeling. Uh, I've wondered uh, how those two fields interact or how they can benefit from each other, like uh, can data science or AI in that case improve numerical modeling uh, or maybe the other way around? Uh, anyway, thanks in advance. Hi, everyone. Even now, the computational sciences are still strongly male dominated. Margot, in your opinion, why have we not seen an improvement in diversity in the last decades? And what could be done to improve the gender balance in the field? Hi, Margot. Computational mathematics or computing and data science are penetrating every field of research, including the humanities and the social sciences. And it is often said that their impact on these fields is large. But how about the other way around? How can humanities and social sciences impact data science? Great questions. Yeah, thanks very much. And, um, and I'm sure that uh, I will um, answer, if not address some of it during the talk as well. It's uh, the type of questions that I think about a lot. So thanks for pre-taping, that was super fun. Okay, uh, we will come to the questions a little bit later on and I'm 100% sure that we will find answers for these questions uh, from your presentation and the explanations. And uh, we have different kinds of possibilities to communicate with each other. I have mentioned this before. And uh, one of them is uh, to ask questions directly and of the, the other, uh, possibility is that you will formulate questions where the um, um, the students and uh, the members of the university uh, can rank this. Let me say it like this one, and uh, we will come back to uh, to this after your first presentation. With other words, the floor is yours, Margo. <laughs> oh, thanks very much, <laughs> and uh, I hope you can now see my slides. So yeah, thanks again, Reina. Uh, absolutely great to be here. Uh, we've been talking about this uh, particular presentation for a while and then COVID hit. And one of the advantages of COVID is that I can be here with you without having to travel. So no jet lag. <laughs> and it's nice uh, and not too early in my morning. I'm not at, on campus right now. I'm actually doing this from Oregon where I live, I live now and I moved to during COVID time because Stanford is still closed to most activities. So when I started thinking about the talk, the first uh, way that my, my clump, and now you can see a picture of a broken clump <laughs> uh, broke was by thinking, oh my goodness, I've been in STEM almost 40 years. Uh, and there've been many, many surprises for me in that time. And, and I think probably one of the biggest surprises for me was that you know although i grew up right here so here is that traditional costume uh or traditional costume with the uh, with the wooden shoes that uh, i wore at least one time <laughs> back in holland then i moved from there as reiner said to uh, california to stanford and then after that i went to new zealand uh, and that was wonderful it's an it's an amazing place to to be uh, but at the time, because of family circumstances and because Stanford offered an opportunity, I went back to Stanford and I've been there for some time. And some of those years, I was director of uh, a institute called Computational and Mathematical Engineering. And I really have the best memories uh, of that time because I was sitting at the interface of many disciplines, mathematics, computing, uh, application areas. My own work has really evolved quite a lot. And sometimes I think, oh, over the last 40 years, I've really started to see the light a little bit better. I started studying mathematics and a lot of physics and, and fluid dynamics. Um, and then at the end of my PhD, I moved uh, into more application areas. So I did coastal ocean dynamics for a while. And then when I was in New Zealand, uh, there were two areas that got my attention. One was coastal ocean dynamics, because New Zealand has, I don't know how many miles of coastline and many, many, many people live on the coast. So uh, it was logical to venture in that area. And the other one was sailing, 
because uh, New Zealand is very well known for its outstanding sailors. And uh, I got involved a little bit through students of mine in the America's Cup yacht races. So, so that was that period. Then I went back to Stanford and I started working subservice. And one of the biggest fun parts of that was to meet Reina and, and other colleagues in, in subservice dynamics. And so that's been great. I worked on oil and gas, I worked on carbon sequestration. And in, in the petroleum uh, engineering uh, at that time, mostly to understand fluid processes uh, subservice a little bit better and to help mitigate harmful environmental consequences. I also did some crazy things, which uh, was really, really fun, but I never expected it. For example, I worked on a replica of a flying pterosaur for a while for National Geographic that we called Herky. And you can view my much younger self <laughs> in the video called Sky Monsters, uh, where uh, I'm seen to lead uh, a small engineering team and a paleontologist in designing this replica. So that was probably the craziest thing I've ever done. I've also spent some time on search engines. Uh, my background, as, you, as I said, is in mathematics and I have done quite a bit of physics and chemistry. Um, but with that mathematics background, you can really go into so many different areas and data science started growing. So I started working on search engines and browsing and recommender systems and one particular project that is one of the pictures on, uh, on the right is uh, working with the Library of Congress on understanding the Library of Congress subject headings, which is the, uh, the library system that we use in the world and many other places. And right now I'm, uh, I've moved on to something totally different and that is uh, more around policy development. And in particular, we're interested in equity. Uh, in this and we're working with uh, some counties around Stanford to see what kind of policies we can put together to transition to electric vehicles and remove internal combustion engine vehicles as equitable as possible. So sometimes people say I'm all over the place, but underneath all of this is, is just a lot of mathematics and, and a curiosity, I would say. Now, in that time, it's, you know, sometimes I feel like grandma talking about this, but really interesting to see what has happened. So this is sort of what my desk looked like when I first started uh, studying. So, uh, you know, nearly 40 years ago. And then after a while, you know, you have to remove things. You don't need glue and scissors and, 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 and paper anymore to build projects. Um, and it may look like this. And now, of course, our desktop mostly looks like this. And in fact, that's all I have. Right now in my office is really a laptop and, and a phone. <laughs> so it's incredible, those changes, and not just in, in personal compute uh, systems and the way that we communicate like this. This was absolutely unheard of, of course, when I first started as a student. We did not have phones. Uh, I touched my first computer only in 1985, and I wrote my first e email in 1990. Uh, but the other thing that happened is that computers themselves just got so much faster. So here's a slide that shows you supercomputer flops over time. This is a logarithmic scale. And if you see those big numbers, that it's unbelievable how many trillions of flops uh, we have right now with, with supercomputers. So a really rapid succession of hardware, but it was not just hardware that changed. When I started, <laughs> I used a typewriter and a Casio calculator. And, and I think Reiner is about the same age as I am. So he will remember this also. Then when I went to university, uh, I used Pascal as a, a language and then moved on to Fort Fortran 77, which I used for many, many years. In the 90s, I picked up MATLAB and I picked up C and C++, and I'm really still using those tools. But what has happened over time is that architectures of computer system change really rapidly and programming languages as a result also. So my students have seen Hadoop, CUDA, Spark, also OpenCL, which I didn't put on this, Python, Julia, R. They've worked with MPI and, and OpenMP. And, and Almost every couple of years, so it seems, there's a new architecture with a new language, of course, requiring us also to work on algorithms and translate them into this language. So I wish we had automatic translating tools like you have from English to, uh, to German or uh, Spanish uh, for programming languages. But it, of course, puts a big burden also on my students, not so much on me because I gave up and I said, you know, I'm doing prototype testing mostly using MATLAB.
So I want to show you one example of uh, a project that uh, I've worked on with colleagues at Stanford, also because it shows you a little bit about Stanford University and the area where we live. So we're going to go fly to San Francisco, uh, to the Bay Area. And uh, in, in this Bay Area, there is a wonderful tidal flow that goes in and out of the Bay really, really strongly. So for those of you who have been in San Francisco, uh, this narrow inlet that you see between the ocean and the bay, that's the Golden Gate. And so right underneath the Golden Gate, you have fantastically strong tidal flows that flow in and out of that bay. And the bay itself is very shallow. So with the tide coming in, it brings in salt water and fresh water comes in through the rivers. And there is a very delicate balance between those two. So we're interested in this and to compute flows like this, we use a method called numerical analysis. And what we really do is instead of trying to solve for the flow everywhere, we solve for the flow in a network of points or locations. And we usually create these networks by triangularizing, in this case in two dimensions, the uh, or putting triangles on uh, on this uh, this area and then in each point of those triangles using physical laws that connect pressure and densities and flow velocities from point to point we try to get a uh, a nice simulation so that is called gridding now you can probably imagine with the advent of all these computers and uh, the faster you know because of this increasing speed there is a tendency for people in this field to do more and more and more bigger and bigger grids more and more points to try to get accuracy and also much more physics. So if the computers are so fast, you can introduce a lot of different models, but it comes with challenges. You know, one of the fun things is for me as a numerical analyst, a computational mathematician, that as you start to, as we call refine, so adding grids, you typically change the physics that you're actually observing numerically. And typically what happens is that the finer you get uh, and the higher the density, uh, the more, uh, uh, sensitive a solution becomes to perturbations. And in other words, you're introducing uncertainty that definitely ha happens in very large simulations like the one we use for climate change. So all of those changes, people first thought, you know, with the computers, we'll get, just get faster and better, but it also brings many, many new challenges and uncertainty quantification has become one of the big uh, <laughs> bread and butters, so to say, of our area. Uh, area. The other thing is very large systems, you have to solve them at some point. So for those of you in mathematics, you know that you use that at some point using a linear solve or maybe a nonlinear solve. And the round of errors that you make and the accumulation of these round of errors really at some point ruins the accuracy gains you have because of the, the larger grids. Now, another thing that people are doing more and more, and you really started seeing this so 30 years ago and 20 years ago, and it gets worse, well, maybe I shouldn't say worse and worse because it's also very interesting, is this thing called multi-model or multi-physics, multi-scale modeling, where many, many, many different models for various parts of the problem are coupled together. So if you wanted to do a global climate model, then you bring in an ocean model and an atmospheric model and a cloud model and a vegetation model, and you name it. There's just so many different models that are all interacting with each other and communicating with each other, and it becomes increasingly complex and therefore increasingly hard to keep track of. So again, many, many challenges and something that I'd never thought possible when I first started in, uh, at university in the early 80s. So sometimes to say, you know, with all with the last 40 years, we've just gotten so much faster in generating the wrong solutions. Okay, so obviously just a little joke, but something to keep in mind. Now, computer science has been around since around the 50s or the 60s. And, and of course, computer science took off following the advance and the uh, ubiquity of the personal computer. Right? But in computational mathematics, over my lifetime as a researcher, we've also seen that take off. And that was following the advance of scientific computing algorithms, some of the algorithms I just talked about, and also public domain software. So one of the interesting things for me, well, when I was a PhD student and an advanced undergraduate student, we hit this time that instead of building your own codes for everything, you could get things off the shelf. So we call them black box software or public domain softwares. And that led to a real change in research. So many, many people would 
just get the softwares off the shelf. Maybe they pay for a commercial license. Maybe they get it from another university or they get it from a research institute and would start applying it without really understanding or knowing what was inside the black box. When I first started in STEM, this was not possible. You build all your own codes. Now, in the 90s, something really interesting happened as a result of it. Boeing, one of the biggest employers at the time of engineers and certainly computational engineers, realized that the people they were getting in were not really developers of their own codes anymore. They didn't really understand the physics all that well. They were really good at using black boxes and they didn't really understand though the data that they were analyzing. And so that was interesting that the company saw this and at that time really started this revolution in education in the United States, particularly for uh, engineers. And that was spearheaded by uh, an old friend of mine called John McMasters, who unfortunately now passed away. And he really took this upon himself and helped rewrite the accreditation standards uh, for engineers to say, no, it's not good enough to just understand off the shelf software and use these black boxes. You really have to understand what's happening. And they went back to first principles. And I mentioned that because I think, and we'll come back to that later, right now I'm in, in a little bit of a deja vu period when it comes to data science. So at that time in the 90s, companies initially also outsourced, right? So there were all these people out there claiming that they could help companies do their simulations for them. They got burned like Boeing and they started then building in-house capacity. And at the same time, the simulation research community, and I was a PhD student at the time, so I was smack in the middle of it, really started thinking about their own best practices. So instead of just blindly following computer codes and, and believing what it spew out, they started creating very well-designed comparative solution projects, established best practices that people needed to follow, and minimal quality assurance and control for publications. And, and, and as I said, redesigned education and training. Now, one of the things though, in all that time, when I started in, uh, at, in the University uh, of Technology in Delft in the Netherlands, um, I certainly was one of the very few women. And so this was in 1984 when I was first year student at the university. And this is what I looked like at the time. Well, not literally, but this is how surprised I was at the time because there were only around 15% female in, in the tech world at the time. And at that university, I think it was only around 6%. And I was often the very only girl in any of the classes that I was taking. And now I'm talking about women, but when you think about diversity in other ways, not just gender, but also race, for example, or ethnicity, it was way worse even. But I thought in 1984 that by the time I would be old, <laughs> and I definitely am old now, according to the standards of my 18 year old self, this would all have been changed. So the question, where were the women? Well, we're going to talk about this in the next segment. But because we do, uh, before we do, I would like to uh, first do a poll. I'm very interested in this, and this will give us a little bit of interaction. And the poll is about something that we call the imposter phenomenon. And if you have the imposter phenomenon, then you may have thoughts like the ones here on the slide. I'm not as capable as people think I am. I'm afraid I just don't have what it really takes to be successful, whatever success means. People will find out that I'm not so smart, <laughs> I'm not sure I really belong, or frequent thoughts like others around me are much more capable than I am. So I wonder if that sounds familiar to you. And I've done these polls uh, numerous times in the United States. So let's see what Stuttgart has to say about this. Let me explain a little bit more how it works with this poll. To participate in the poll, please use the URL www.menti.com. You will find the link in the chat as well on the, on the screen. And there is an, an, an code to enter. And it's 48743089. But again, you can find all this kind of information uh, on the screen and in the chat. We will display the results of the poll right here on the screen. But in between, we can enjoy a little bit music. Correct, Margot? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> and the music, it's important to mention, uh, is not from, I don't know, but is from Margot's son. 
Okay. Yeah. My Music? song is a bit of a composer. It's possible. So the results are on the screen. Margot, the floor is yours. Please try to explain why we get these results. <laughs> yeah, so you have to help me here. Let me put my glasses on. Maybe then I can see it. Um, so what I, is the blue? Can you see it, Margot? I cannot see it all that well, but you can help me guide through. So what is the blue? The I can start with the... The green one that it's, tw I, I need, I need my glasses too, but I have a little <laughs> bit trouble with my glasses. I need new ones, Margo. That's my problem. Yeah. Uh, never is pink and it's 8%. Yes, often uh, 53%. It's the blue. Yes, something, sometimes, sorry, it's yes. 54. It's yellow. And the green one is only isolatedly. That means, for instance. Okay. Can, okay. Would you like to interpret this? That it's your partner. Yeah, this is to this inform is not, the other ones. <laughs> this is this is not so unusual. So one of the things that's so interesting is when the imposter syndrome uh, first started, when people first started talking about it, they thought it was a, a women's thing only, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this poll. Uh, and they said, oh, this is something that females suffer from much more. But in all my uh, polls that I've done on campus, I actually find out that around 80% of the students also on campus suffer from the imposter phenomenon and that it really impacts their work and it impacts the enjoyment that they have. So a little bit later at the end in my last segment on education, I wanna come back to that too, but it's important for you to see now that the vast majority of the people in the audience, and I'm absolutely certain the vast majority are not women, uh, suffer to some extent from this imposter syndrome. So men as well. So let me move on to, to women in, uh, in uh, in uh, engineering and STEM, unless you have a question, Rainer. No, only a statement. You know, we are the technical university, and I'm, I agree with you that it's one of the reasons. Go ahead with the second part yeah, of your presentation. Ex exactly that. So I'm sure the audience is predominantly male. So yeah. look at that. Yeah. Uh, we're all in this boat together. So anyway, you know, one of the reasons why my wooden shoe broke again was because now in 2021, where I'm old, right, according to my 18 year old self, really very little has changed. So when you look in tech, it's still only about 15% uh, uh, females. And so this is me now, slightly older, right? And I, I still feel like I'm, I'm only six years old sometimes. <laughs> so the women are still gone. Now, and if you look at the, the numbers, actually it doesn't look so great when you look at engineering or computer science. In computer science in the last uh, 20, 30 years, it's actually gone down. And the same in, uh, well, engineering, it's around that 15%, okay? And um, in math, it's gone up a little bit. Uh, the numbers are very good in, in theoretical mathematics, but not in computational mathematics. That's interesting. As soon as you put computations in, the number of women goes down. Now, compared, for example, to health, you see, of course, that the numbers there are the, the other way around. So what is really happening? Well, here is what I've, over many years of looking at this and working with women, have found that unfortunately there's two, two, still two myths that are so frequently debunked, but that people still believe in. And these myths lead to this imposter syndrome, but again, not just for the women, and also something called stereotype threat, that when you are aware that you're a woman uh, because of these two myths, you may underperform. So the first myth is that success in mathematics and computer science and engineering, but actually that's also in philosophy and in fin the financial sector and in business, there is this misconception and this myth that to be successful, you need to have really, really strong innate ability, it means that you have to have a natural talent and otherwise you can forget it. Now you probably heard People say in mathematics, I, I just don't know how to do mathematics or I'm just not good at it. The funny thing is you never hear people say this or very seldom about speaking or walking or eating, <laughs> particularly not eating. So it's interesting because all of it are learned skills, but somehow 
for mathematics and coding, people think, unless you have this natural talent, you cannot be successful. Now, natural talent helps, of course. I'm not saying that it doesn't, but it is not essential. So it's the difference between uh, sufficient and sufficient and necessary for those of you in the mathematical uh, sciences. Now, the second myth is the killer for women. And that is the myth that girls or women have less innate ability like that than men or boys. And that has been debunked many times as well. So there's absolutely no reason to assume that a woman cannot do as well as, as a man. But these myths are so persistent. They're everywhere in popular culture. And it starts really, really early. So it really already starts, I think, uh, with the segregation of genders uh, in, in two different classes, with the way that we race our kids culturally. We cannot um, ignore that fact. Well, by the time we get to elementary school, most of our teachers are female. And when I volunteer at elementary schools around Stanford, and, uh, and I've done the same in the Netherlands, uh, very often uh, when I come into a math class, the teacher who is female will make comments like, oh, class, the guest is here. We have to do a little bit of math now, but don't worry, after this, we'll have some fun again. And I'm thinking, I'm the fun. The math is the, is the fun. Now, research has shown that at an early age, boys, and, and um, I apologize to the people who are non-cisgender because I only talk about boys uh, and, and girls here. But boys look up to male role models more and take what male, rodel, male role models say more to heart. And girls do that with women. So if you have a female uh, elementary school teacher telling you math is not so great or feeling nervous themselves about mathematics, then girls pick up on that more than boys. In the United States, uh, segregation or placement tests for mathematics take place when the girls are around seven or eight, and then they're put in advanced track or not so advanced tracks. So at that time already, there is this distinction uh, that you often see between girls and boys. And girls typically don't do well because of the stereotype threat that I talked about earlier uh, as, as boys. Now, there are many other things that we hear that we take for granted and accept when it's about woman, uh, about a woman. So here's this wonderful Twitter uh, account called The Man Who Has It All, and he flips this around. So, for example, if we hear, oh, hey, women, you can choose to be anything you want to be. Nobody thinks that's weird. When you say, oh, man, you can choose, choose to be anything you want to be, you go, boys, then that sounds very, very strange. Similarly, we often hear uh, that when we are women, uh, we're just a little bossy when, uh, when we have leadership quality. So when, when a woman displays leadership qualities, they're seen to be as aggressive and a little bossy. Uh, when men display uh, or boss people around, they say, he has leadership qualities. So when you turn this around, it, it sounds very funny to most people. Well, what that means is there is prejudice there that uh, we really have to be aware of. Now, the other thing, of course, that drives me nuts is that we have things like this happening to women too, where we're constantly confronted with this idea that we have to be perfect in, in every way. So let's turn this around and let's ask the men as well. So uh, Rainer, I don't know if you moisturized your hair this morning, but I hope you did. <laughs> I've tried to do my best. <laughs> so what are some of the approaches? Well, one of the things that I've been hearing for decades, literally for decades, because I started hearing this when I was a senior in high school, so that's almost 40 years ago, is this notion of lean in. So leaning in meaning, and in fact, Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook wrote a book about it called Lean In. And the idea is that you conform now to a male-dominated culture in, in STEM and computer science. You enter that culture, and then when you're in the leadership position, you change the culture from within. That is, in short, a little bit about leaning in. So really what that does also, it puts the onus, it puts the responsibility on the women. So if we want the culture to change, we should enter and change it when we are in a position to do so. I think a culture which is set by the majority not by the minority, should be changed from within by the majority. And of course, one way to really help this is to increase the number of women in, in, uh, in work, but also to be aware of any biases that you have. Uh, 
So lean in, uh, you see many, many comments out there and, and self-help books and videos that say to women, uh, change the tone of your voice so that you're taken more seriously. Lean forward a little bit like this, maybe stare, get a little bit closer to people so that they really notice you. Um, or uh, avoid words like perhaps or maybe or sorry, which it seems uh, that women use more than men. I think it's because they're maybe a little bit more polite at times. So um, the other thing, of course, that happens that we have to be aware of, and that's one of the big barriers, is that when, when you are in a monoculture, so when you are in an environment where it's mostly men, you feel comfortable with men. And, and so accepting or promoting a woman just feels, or any other uh, uh, type of, uh, of um, uh, diversity, uh, so underrepresented minorities, for example, also, this feels uh, like a risky or riskier thing. So people preferentially hire like people and stay with people like themselves a lot. So it takes a while to break through this. Also criteria for promotion, criteria for acceptance, for hiring are often created by the majority group. And very often it's not even seen that these may be biased. So I don't think uh, lean in is the way to go. So. Um, enough already really. What we've been doing in many places now, uh, and we're working with, with many folks on this, uh, certainly through women in data science is to say, let's change this and get back to 30% uh, women by 2030 at all levels. So that takes a little bit of time. So we have a little campaign called 30 by 30. So if you want to join, send me an email. And here is what we're doing. We're promoting women. So I don't mean necessarily in terms of salary or, or a position, but promoting by making them visible, by normalizing that they're there. Because if we can normalize that they're there, then they're no longer seen as different. And I think then the culture can, can change. A more inclusive culture, by the way, is good for everyone. It's also good for the introverted men. It is good for, for anyone who doesn't quite fit the stereotype successful person in tech. Now, it's not so hard to do this because there are many, many, many outstanding women doing outstanding work. And when uh, I was um, uh, a, uh, about uh, six years ago or so, when I was invited to go to a conference and give a talk and I couldn't make it, and then later found out that all of the speakers at that conference were men, I was told uh, when I asked them about this, oh, Marco, you couldn't make it. So that's why we don't have any, <laughs> any women speaking. And then of course I asked, well, well, how about other women? There must be more. And they said, well, we looked everywhere, but we just couldn't find them. So at that point I decided, okay, uh, we need to do something about it. We really need to promote these amazing women that I know working in data science and working in computational math and scientific computing. So we started this uh, movement called Women in Data Science. And here are just six of my sheroes, as, uh, as we often say, um, from all over the world. And I put in two uh, German women as well who really impressed me, and Andrea Mar Martin from IBM and Maria Schuld. Uh, she is now in South Africa and she is a, a big person in quantum computing. So what is WIDS Women in Data Science trying to do? It's a global organization and we want to inspire women to join the field. We want to educate everybody regardless of gender or background. And we want to, of course, support women in the field, but mostly we just want to normalize women. So we put out an enormous number of talks and workshops all done by women for everybody to normalize the presence of women in this field more. We started in 2015 with a relatively small event, uh, just a regular conference, but we did live stream. And in 2015, that didn't happen so often that you started live streaming. And to our big surprise, we got thousands of people on this live stream. So we thought we'd build it out and we used a hybrid mode where we have a central conference that we're live streaming, but many regional events around the world. And this is what it looked like last year. So we had uh, over 200 conferences uh, around the world last year, despite of COVID. And this year it's looking to get close to 300. Um, 
the workshop and and the, sorry the conference just happened in in march on international women's day and you can go online and see this as well and we have all sort of things on our website too we have a datathon we run every year i host a podcast show with just female guests and uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. now this is all because of over 600 or so volunteers around the world that we call our wits ambassadors and the stories that these WITS ambassadors and the attendees uh, tell are really wonderful to hear. So here are just two, and they speak to the sense of belonging that they have when they're joining a, an organization like this. 10% or so of our participants, by the way, are men or other genders. So uh, we, we certainly see this and we want men to come because very few men in STEM have ever been in a situation where they're the only different person or one of the few different people in the room. And very often when men come, they say, oh my goodness, people are looking at me when I stand up and go to the bathroom because I'm, I'm different. Uh, and say, yeah, that's what it feels like to us. And so it's really good for men also to come and, and experience, uh, experience that. Now, as a woman in this field, I, I can tell you many, many stories. There's some really interesting things that happen in this money culture of, of men. And I just wanted to tell you one of my own stories, which always cracked crack me up to this date. I was in Cambridge uh, uh, some, sometime, Cambridge University, and I was invited by one of the colleges to come to the high table. And it was extremely fun to be at this high table, but it was sitting across uh, an older gentleman professor at Cambridge. And the first thing he asked me, uh, uh, and I would, by the way, I was invited for the high table because I was the guest speaker uh, in, in uh, physics and mathematics uh, at that time. And he asked me, who are you with? Um, because assuming that I was uh, the spouse of the speaker. So I said, oh, no, I'm the speaker. So he, he looked very surprised and he says, Oh, so uh, where, where, where are your professor? And I cannot do English action very well, but that's sort of how it came across. And so I, I mentioned California and I mentioned Stanford University. And then he just told me point blank said that he was really surprised that they allowed blonde women in California to become professors. <laughs> and he was half, half joking, I hope, but certainly also half seriously. So I leaned over to him and I said to him, said, don't worry, you know, it's fake blonde. I just get highlights. I'm really a brunette, uh, but it shows you that that these sort of things still happen. And in terms of sexual harassment and so on, I've certainly experienced everything in my career from from groping to sexual assault to uh, what we call microaggressions, colleagues telling me, hey, you're not so bad for for a woman and so on. Um, and luckily now we are in the climate that we can address that a bit more. But for my own, in my own personal experience, I always felt it was balanced by some of the very positive things. And there are fabulous uh, colleagues also in our field as, as Rainer uh, models, because he is one of the most inclusive and welcoming uh, professors I've ever met uh, in, in my field. So check us out at, at this conference, uh, at this uh, website, sorry, witsconference.org. And you can see talks, podcasts, workshops, datathon, high school outreach. Uh, so we've been talking about data and, uh, and data science and women in data science. And you may wonder why, if you have been in STEM all so long, why didn't you start Women in STEM? But there are many other organizations of women in STEM. But there is an absolute reason, a very good reason why to focus on data science now, because data science is the big thing at the moment. And we see more and more people go in that area. And it's very important to me that women have a seat at the table. So I'd like to do another poll. And let's see if, uh, if, it, if it goes uh, well this time. But Raina, here's what the poll is about. I'm very curious to see how many of you in Stuttgart, and again, I've done these polls many times also across the United States, uh, use data science in their work and how important data science skills have become. So whether you are a chemical engineer or a mechanical engineer or a physicist, or uh, maybe even uh, not just, but, but a manager or a leader uh, or a staff member, how important has data science become and with data science i mean data wrangling data mining machine learning deep deep learning ai anything from relatively straightforward data analysis maybe using linear regression all the way to the latest convoluted neural networks so the poll hopefully is open and hopefully you can hear 
the music again uh, soon. Thanks a, thanks a lot, Margot. Now we will give you again a few minutes uh, to think about uh, Margot's question. And uh, please try to uh, do it as good as possible. And then we will come back to a few questions from the audience. Wonderful. Music, is it? So now the results, Margot. Uh, it's a little bit more readable. How important are data science skills in your current studies or work? The first one is very important, 49%. 50%, wow. Then important, moderately, 31%. A little important, 35%. These are numbers of people, no? And not important, six. That means, for instance, data and data science and to get an understanding about this is extremely imp important for the students, for the whole society, uh, for the future. Now question. Okay, now I have questions for the first part and the second part. My first question is related to the uh, software uh, that you have mentioned. You mentioned a deja vu concerning the uh, black boxing of simulation codes, okay? Does you see the same transition means the community takes the step back and is redoing the implementation development or do you only see the need for it. Margot, what is necessary to do? Uh, well, so so there's a couple of things. So people often say, Margot, you're you're going again black boxes, but black boxes also offer so many opportunities. And, and it's true, but you do need to understand what's in it. And one of the things that is uh, is is really tough is when people use black boxes and they believe everything that comes out and they don't know how to interrogate the system. And if you don't understand what's under the hood, what's in the black box, it's really hard to understand whether or not this black box may be making a mistake. And so I play these games often with students. I give them software that I've developed myself and I purposely put in a bug. And then I ask them in my class, they hate it when I do this, but it works really well. I ask them to use this software that I've written uh, to get a result. And the result that they get is wrong. And they, but they present it, they present it beautifully with lovely PowerPoint presentations, for example. And then when they un, uh, unveil that, uh, you know, or, or re, um, that I show them that there is actually a bug in this, they get mad. <laughs> but, but I do this because I want them to always uh, uh, question and critique what the software gives them. And, and then when I ask them, well, go into the software and find a bug, they find it really hard to do because they don't quite understand what is being done inside. So does it mean that you have to write all your own code? No, it doesn't mean that at all. What it does mean is that you need to understand the algorithms that are being used, that you really need to understand also how to guide the algorithm. So very, very often algorithms have default parameters that you're setting. Uh, so it's sort of uh, tweak parameters, if you like, to get the best performance out. You need to know what the default settings are. Are. And you need to play with the code enough to see whether or not you can really have confidence in it. So you need to do a lot of perturbation studies. Uh, when we a commercial software first started, there was a, a company, I won't name the name, but we were using the software for a while for the SIL analysis that I talked about earlier. And we found a bug in the software. So, softwares are always buggy. There is not a single piece of code without an error, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, um, Margot, I have now a question that the transfer or bridge the gap from your first part to the second part. Uh, you know, I told you this, the University of Stuttgart is a technical university and we have low numbers and uh, we have this mint problem, uh, you call this a uh, steam problem, and now the world will be changed. You know, the classical part was more about oil and engines and so on. And now we come more in the world to integrate more data, more software, more uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. My question is now, is this a good starting point to what motivate, as one argument, more women to be in science? Is it easier for them then? What do you think? It's new. There isn't any kind of old man like me that says, wow, great to have an engine with a lot of oil in it. 
It's a new technology, a new field. Is this a very good starting point? What is your impression? Well, I was very hopeful when, when data science first really started and, and it's been going on for, of course, a long time. But the last 15 years, we've really seen uh, this sort of uh, a change in the, where data science is really penetrating all fields. And this is a perfect segue, by the way, in the next part of the talk, where I talk a little bit more about data science. And I thought that we would see more women entering, particularly through mathematics and through statistics. But what happened is that the very large companies that are really driving this, so the Googles, the Facebooks, Twitters, and, and, and other companies, also company like a German company like uh, SAP, um, that they are still predominantly male. And one of the reasons for that is, I think, is another misconception that you must be a coder, you must be a hacker to really be successful in this field. And so again, these myths come up to people say, I'm just not good enough for this. Um, and so we don't see the numbers. Uh, data science is one of the areas where we're not below, not above, say, 15%, depending on how you count. Very, very hard to get uh, exact numbers. At the undergraduate level, you often see in, 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 in universities that really work on this a, uh, an increase in the number of girls in, the, in those areas, but it quickly dissipates also in industry where the culture is very male dominated. And sometimes in Silicon Valley, you know, women that, that are going into uh, Silicon Valley and work there, they come back or leave it and say it's more of a, a student culture, fraternity culture that uh, they don't feel comfortable in. So no, it, it hasn't uh, materialized, but uh, one of the great things, which I'm also gonna say, is that good data science really needs people from all backgrounds. Absolutely not just people from computer science or from computational mathematics or other areas that are heavily computational. We need people from all sorts of people coming into this field. Um, so we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now I have two questions from the, from, the, from the student side. There is one question, I personally hate math in a school. Okay, even failed my linear algebra course in my bachelor course. I hope it's not a sim simulation technology student. And <laughs> <laughs> I was, he was upset about this. But just, uh, he now tries to get his PhDs in a, a doctoral program. But how do we discover a push for confirmatory at young age, how we can push them, how we can motivate them. Try yeah. to be fair, my, my wife is a teacher for mathematics. Go ahead. Uh. No, that is great. <laughs> well, so I mentioned one thing is that it's really important, I think, at a young age that, that, that students get to hear that mathematics is useful and fun and that the people who are teaching it uh, in elementary school when they first started really enjoy it and are well equipped to do so. And I think many, many, at least in the United States, let me talk to that. And my own experience in elementary school a long time ago was the same. Many teachers are not that well equipped to teach uh, mathematics uh, because they themselves have, have some fear or they don't have a really good uh, link to uh, realistic practical problems that they can use as, as examples to really show the importance of, uh, of mathematics. So that is one um, way. But the other thing is when you, when you really start looking at how we teach math and how we start, uh, I think we, we really need to redesign this. Uh, we, we certainly we need foundations, but the way that we introduce mathematics and and I'm now talking about the United States, um, where we start with algebra uh, and then we go to calculus and, and it's only in the very later classes that applications come up and that people see the benefits of mathematics and and that is a real shame also data which speaks to people you know most people like data they like looking at graphs and they like playing with data and understanding things like we just did the poll it's fun to see data and that sort of savviness around data that awareness around data comes way too late so i think we need to rethink the way that we start math when i get people i teach a lot of math classes at university and when i get students to university there are often two things one is they don't understand that math can really be very enjoyable and and it's like a new language a new tool and it can be applicable but the other thing 
thing often they they've been math shy so they've never liked it so they don't do as much of it and and they come into a math class and they're very rusty so for those of you who've experienced that say you 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 have a little bit of avoidance behavior because you don't like math maybe as much then when you do come into a math class it takes you a long time to warm up and to do well and that's one thing that i always tell students as well math is a little bit like running you don't run a marathon once a year without training you know you cannot just come in and do that and it's the same with math math uses a language in your head and connections that you need to um you need to stimulate and 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 you need to work on and so it's much better to do a little bit of math every day for example than once a week when your assignment is due um and and when i find when i talk to the students about this and i guide them through it and i do a little bit of a math boot camp <laughs> just like you would do a boot camp if you wanted to get more fit um then they usually get enjoyment because then they speak that language better and they enjoy it better and of course i intersperse it with many examples Margot, last question for this part uh it's a tough question How do you okay. get men, but also other in power positions to get past that conform zone and hire more diverse people, which means also more work initially? Well, yes, of course, it needs more work because it is super easy to just hire people that look like you, right? Because you <laughs> understand them and uh, and you probably know some, so that's easy. But but what is the responsibility of a leader? The responsibility of a leader or a manager uh, in, in a company or at a university is to ensure that the people in that system can thrive and also to ensure that the system is accessible and open to everybody who desires to be there. Um, and so I, I really uh, resist this notion of it's, it's so much work or it's hard. I think it's when you're a leader, it's your duty. If you see a very small percentage of women, you can rest assured that your culture is not as inviting as it probably should be. It's really, really paramount that you understand if women feel comfortable, if women thrive. And when you think about thriving and you think about promoting or hiring, also think about what kind of criteria you are applying. And this is something that uh, I talk about a lot also on campus, because very often when, when we're um, interviewing people, there are typical um, metrics that are used to assess somebody's quality. And there was one in a meeting where people said about a female candidate who I thought was amazing and her CV looked fantastic, where some of my male uh, com committee members said, um, well, her CV looks outstanding, but I don't think she has the, you know, je ne sais quoi, the, that special thing. And, and I asked them, said, can you please make that clear to me? So you agree that what she's done is is really fantastic and maybe the best candidate but she doesn't have ah oh, that thing that you can said is it maybe because she's not a man so um they laughed and said no no it's it's about confidence she lacks confidence and so i turned it around and i said you mean she's not as much of a pardon the french bullshitter as some of the male <laughs> candidates that we've that we've seen i mean and and i was trying to be very provocative on provocative on person right and and i i i didn't think i thought these male candidates were, were good but there is this idea that a certain type of confidence um is is incredibly important and i think very often with uh, with diverse candidates they have a different way of being in the room they may be a little bit more humble they may be a little introvert they may be a little shyer that doesn't mean they're not uh, as clever so these sort of biases that people have subconscious or not um, really need to be questioned and so interrogate that for yourself uh, Margo, i agree with you 100 my impression is that that group has done a big mistake my understanding is if you have really a mixed group with different interest then you have really an optimum that helps to solve problems. But let us come to the next part of your presentation. And it's important I, yeah. to mention yeah. that we have more than 400 participants. That's not so bad, I think so. Yeah, that But, is wonderful. Yeah, I'm really happy about this. But Margot, 
The floor is yours again. Yeah, and just a little bit about this diversity. That's one of the reasons why it's so so very important. And we'll talk about this in this section too, because we're going to be looking at data science. And this is a slide that I showed earlier uh, that I went through this phase where computational mathematics really started. And now we're in another phase where data science is really taking off even more so maybe than computational mathematics. Okay. So uh, here comes data science, and it's unbelievable when you start thinking about data. So in the minutes that I use to cover this slide, look at all these numbers. I don't know how many uh, data are being generated just on social media, okay? So four and a half million YouTube videos viewed per minute, approximately, maybe more now. These are 2020 data. Four million internet searches. Maybe some of you are looking up some things on the internet as we're speaking. Between now and the weekend, uh, I don't know how many tweets sent, lots of petabytes of data created on, on Facebook and lots of messages said, sent on WhatsApp. So these are some of the numbers that are mind boggling, but of course it's not just this, uh, this sort of data, it's also data associated say with remote sensing. Uh, before COVID, we had 400 satellites put up in, in uh, around the, the world in space uh, per year. This is unbelievable. And what are these satellites doing? They're used for communication, but they're also used for observing, uh, so remote sensing. We have so many sensors around the world now that look at air pollution and, and, uh, and, and other, the weather and, and you name it. So, uh, and trillions of dollars spent also on IT. So this is ex exploding and AI is exploding and and I just wanted to put this up because it, it um, this is a really funny AI timeline that so it was sort of came out of the onion which is a, uh, a spoof uh, news uh, service uh, that we have uh, here in the United States um, so this is just for a little bit of fun and let you let you read this all right, but what is happening is the data is penetrating uh, all areas. Now in, in these 40 years, and this is another uh, thing that I'd never had thought I would see, we really started seeing a change in science and engineering. And we, when I was a student, everything was data supported. Of course we had data. You know, we needed data to run models as well. We needed data, for example, if we're running a flow model for viscosity, we need data to understand density and, and, and chemistry and so on. So I would say then at that time when I was a student, everything was data supported. Then it became data inspired. And what I mean by that is we started getting more data and, and that gave us some more insights, observational data. And we started to think that happened, for example, in my career with coastal ocean modeling, we had really interesting information coming from, from small submarines in Monterey Bay, very close to Stanford, that were roaming around uh, in, in the subsurface and collecting data and saying, whoa, could we model this too? There's some really interesting things happen. So data was inspiring the modeling. But now we're in this phase where we're really data driven. So the data comes first, the data comes last. And there are people actually using data algorithms to, um, to run simulations without really understanding or using the physics. Now, I think the, the most beautiful connection is where, where physics and, and data meet each other. And there are definitely approaches there uh, that, uh, that can be very useful, uh, synthetic um, synthesis and, and cross-fertilization. But we really see a science approach shifting. And it's big, right? And increasingly critical. So sometimes people say data is now the new oil, it's the new gold, the new bacon, whatever, whatever you fancy, it's the new whatever. But it's big and increasingly critical and, and the markets are just growing all the time. And everybody's jumping on it or everybody can jump on it is what people say. They talk about democratization, that everybody can do this. And there's public domain software and there are data sets and, uh, and you don't uh, need to be uh, working at Google to participate and share. But is that really the case? So when we look at uh, where data science is really happening, here are the main centers in the world for data science. So a big one, of course, it's in the United States and, and with Stanford, we're sitting smack in the middle of Silicon Valley, but there are also really great centers in, in Austin, for example, in, uh, in the Boston area also. And you see some centers, you see here some centers in Germany. So there you go. I'm sure one of those circles is close to Stuttgart. You see some things happening in India, for sure, Australia, um, and, and of course, uh, a lot in China. And, and uh, I'm sorry, but the circle are 
over China uh, disappeared here. That's, that should have been a very large circle. But all in all, you see also many parts of the world are not participating. So it's certainly not a globalization of data science. And there are few people around the table. And most of the people who are around the table are male, as we just talked about. And many of them are either white or, or they are Asian males. So we're missing many people around the table. And as Reina said earlier, the more diverse people you have around the table, the better the questions that you're asking, because obviously it's all about the questions. But the other reason why I'm really concerned about this is because there is an enormous, enormous amount of wealth creation associated with this, and few are sharing in the wealth. So we have people like Bezos and, and uh, Zucker, uh, Zuckerberg and, and the Google guys, uh, you know, and, and so many of those people really uh, owning so much of the wealth uh, around the world now. And we want everybody to, to be able to share this. So what you also hear, and this is what you have to read the, the call out cloud here, my thoughts. Um, I read a, a tweet just the other day from a colleague of mine in computer science to say, all domains will eventually be subdomains of computer science. So there is this notion that computer science and data science are ruling everything and that everybody uh, should uh, ultimately become part of that. And my answer to that is no, they won't. Um, data-driven decision-making and data-driven prediction really is a community effort. One of the nice things is that you really can only ask the right questions and solve the right questions in the right way. If you involve domain experts, you need to involve humanists and data and social scientists because so much of the data that we're interrogating um, has a direct impact on uh, society. And there are wonderful problems, of course, also in those areas in, in their own right. And by the way, uh, those areas are led by the domain experts. They're not led by computer scientists. It's, a f it's crazy for computer scientists sometimes to say, let us go into the humani humanities and we'll, make, we'll solve it all. We'll make a big, a big um, a difference. But you hear that and there's a little bit uh, of arrogance, I think. So everybody comes in, econo e economists, lawyers, policymakers. And, and the reason for that is that really good data science and data-driven decision-making, the question comes first, not the data. So it's really important to understand what tools are also most appropriate for tackling the question. And this is, this is something that I think about a lot when I uh, look at data science or AI right now, because it seems that everybody just starts to go to deep neural networks to solve <laughs> to solve any problem, and I always feel it's like baby Bam Bam with their with a big hammer uh, smashing on on everything. So no, the answer is not always a deep neural network. Sometimes all you have to do is use a bit of linear regression, and you need to think very very hard about the data. So I won't go through this list, but this is one of the lists that I had my students go through. For example, when you're using data, you really really need to understand what it gives you and also what it does not give you. Now, there are many things that you see in this area that are pain points. There is a, uh, you see people calibrating and then calling it prediction. Uh, you see people making correlations and then calling it causations. Uh, you see people say more data will make the algorithm better. Well, where have we heard that before? That was the same as in the, in the simulation community. You see people really looking at phantom patterns and relations because they don't really understand what they're looking at all that well. And they don't know whether what they're seeing is the truth or a phantom. And there is a tremendous amount of bias that creeps in and there are ethical uh, implications. And here are just some titles that you see uh, in, uh, in magazines or newspapers that, that show you this. Um, there are people now talking about explainable AI. That is great, but it also means that a lot <laughs> beforehand was not explainable. And so we're using these sort of systems um, and uh, for those of you who understand how, how they work, you know what I'm, I'm talking about, without really understanding the why. Why does a deep neural network at times come up with this answer? It's very hard to interrogate that. So bias uh, comes in. And this is a little bit of a deja vu. There's hype, there are black boxes, they're outsourcing. And this get what companies are outsourcing. They're getting burned and they're starting now to build in-house capacity for that too. Um, so this is what we saw also 20 years ago in the simulation community. And the data science community really should now establish good 
back practices have minimal QA, QC for publications and, and probably also redesign education and training. It baffles me that in many data science uh, or computer science departments around the world, uh, the students do not get any exposure to ethics, do not get exposure to the humanities. You know, they are going to be the one later developing algorithms that are impacting our lives. They should know about those impacts and they should know how to minimize unintended or intended negative consequences. So it's time to talk about education now as the last little bit. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to have a have a poll because I'm curious, you know, we've all been in this really quite terrible and, and also at the same time kind of interesting from an education point of view experience where uh, we've turned to online learning and learning in the virtual environment. I still do that. That's why I'm in Oregon teaching uh, to Stanford. So I wondered how you feel about this. So the poll will come up in a bit with some music and let's see how effective you found this. Try to be a little bit, oh, there are the results. Oh, fantastic. Oh, I need a little bit my, my let me go from the right to the left. Uh, yeah, read them to me right Personally now. found to or teach in a virtual environment, in person learning or teaching. About the same 11, much less effective 24, 21, a bit more effective 22, a bit less effective 31, and I cannot see the left one. Much more effective. Much more effective. And what is the number there? Six, five, six. 65? Only six. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay. But, but, yep, that is very common. Uh, yeah. But it's a little bit of a mixed bag. You know, mm -hmm. there, I've certainly seen some people thrive in this environment, but many people yeah. are really missing the connection. Mm -hmm. hey, Margot, we have two questions. Um, one, I think it's very important for us, especially for Stuttgart. You know, we have changed a little bit the name of one of the center of excellences from simulation science to data integration simulation science. And there's one question from a student. Um, I was wondering how these two fields, simulation and data, interact or benefit from each other. Can data science help to advance numerical modeling or the other way around? Who is the leading field uh, related to these two topics? <laughs> yeah, so this is a wonderful question. And of course, people are, are playing at, it, at this interface a lot. But let me just uh, say first that the simulation community has always been a very strong data oriented community because we're producing data. And, and one of the ways that data science is really helping now is, is actually for, for my own field is about 15 years ago, we, we started um, simulating Monterey Bay, which is a super interesting coastal region very close to Stanford. And we created this, these databases of, I don't know how many terabytes of data on Monterey Bay. We never had the chance at that time to actually go in and look at that four dimensional data, 3D in space and then in time in a really good way. Now data mining techniques are available so we can go back to the data that we actually created to our virtual laboratory and actually see the data. So that's a, a clear way in which data, of course, uh, data science can help. Uh, data science approaches are used also in the very engine of simulation. So there are approaches uh, in linear algebra that use data science. And for example, for those of you who, who really know this stuff uh, in, in, in solving nonlinear systems. So if you are familiar, a very technical thing with the Newton uh, search or Newton uh, iterative method, for example, you know that you uh, would like to get a better start vector and data science is now helping find a, a better starting guess for, for iterations. So that's an interesting thing. 
Now, the other thing is also is that if you, if you work on a system that you can observe and for which you have data, then of course there is a really interesting uh, area in which you're using the data that you're seeing at the same time as the simulation that you're running and integrating the two. That started with techniques called the data integration like Kalman filtering, for example, but now we can often do this uh, on the fly. There are also people that say, you know, I'm going to build a, a neural network that uses some form of physical law in, in the network um, and that, uh, that describes and, and conditions that network using, using the physics. So there are many ways in which these two can come together. The, the one thing I don't like, and I've seen, and it doesn't, I don't think it works unless the uh, flow is quite predictable, um, is where you use a pure data-driven approach. So we see some of that also in the subsurface, where people say, look at this, I, I, I don't need to run a simulation. I just use a lot of data, but um, and then I can and do predictions out, but we're still at the stage where that data then often is um, generated itself by simulations that you're running. And so uh, sometimes people claim that they can run things faster, but it's only after using the simulation many, many times to generate the data. But it's a lovely intersection to be and a very good place to be. I think that we'll, we're going to see a lot of new development in that area. Thanks a lot, Margot. Um, we, get, we have got plenty of questions and we cannot uh, uh, yeah. can discuss all these kinds of questions. Thank you very much uh, to the audience. Try to be active again. Last questions to this before we transfer to the last part of your presentation. Yeah. It's a tricky question. Do you agree that emphasize is one of the most important assess in science? Has it enabled more efficient team, teamwork or therefore great achievements? And the question and the key question is, and how we get this kind of uh, elements into the teaching part and the education part, especially in STEAM or with our words in MINT. Okay, so the, so the question is about uh, how to build diverse teams. And yeah, uh, and, yeah so I really think that uh, having... Uh, diverse voices around the table is extremely good. You, you otherwise you get um, the risk of building uh, bubbles and and what we call echo chambers. So even in in my research team, when when you are working with the same team for a, a, a lot and you don't invite people in from outside to listen to you, or you don't go out to give talks about what you're doing, um, you get the echo chamber where every everybody says to everybody, "What we're doing is great. You know, we're the best." So you always have to expose yourself. Right, and and so that's a, a clear sign that that is super effective. If I want to test ideas, I go outside. I ask other people to come in and think about those ideas. And of course, we need to do that in teams too. So in some in some places, you also see um, that that people uh, use team switches, so that uh, the teams are are that that are put together are often moved around. People are moved around from team to team just to get some fresh eyes looking at a problem. Um, in, in, in education, that often means that we, we need to uh, teach much more interactively. And, and so before COVID, uh, but also now, because you can do this online too, that we've seen uh, great movements in, in, that, in, uh, in that direction uh, at a much larger scale than before. I've always tried to do this in my classes where I have people collaborate with each other. We have a lot of uh, project work. Um, and I make sure that the students are 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 working well together. Um, but uh, so it it is often involves a redesign. We can chat a little bit about this also in the in the next uh, part. Thanks a lot, Margot. I agree with you, and that's um, that's nice uh, to hear from your your side. I'm a little bit proud of my own university. We have really a high number of international students. We need a little bit more on the professor professor level. But I think on the PhD and postdoc level, uh, I would like to say it with my words related to my culture here from Baden-Württemberg, that's not so bad. Okay, now we okay. must have a little that's, bit of speed great. up. <laughs> yeah, speed yeah, up. we're, we're going to go to the, to for, the last For the last section. one, yeah. and Maro, of course, you know, the floor is yours again. Go ahead, please. Fantastic. And of course, what you also have to be, be aware of, not only that you invite people in that are different, but you also really listen to them and that, that doesn't always happen. 
All right, so a, a few thoughts to, to end here um, uh, on, uh, on changes on, in education. And, and whenever I think about this, I think, oh my goodness, I'm getting old. But here is one change. Here are all the students running into big pillars on campus. This is a picture of, of Stanford campus because they're all looking at their iPhones. So that's something that I never thought I'd see. Now, over the last uh, over the last decades, we certainly see uh, many many differences in in what what they say is optimal teaching. So I've seen changes from pure blackboards everywhere to overheads, which was a big thing. I used to carry an overhead bulb with me just in case it burned out in the classroom. To PowerPoint, we've seen project based learning uh, uh, exper uh, um, uh, experiments and and uh, I think project-based learning is essential to any type of uh, teaching and classroom uh, uh, development uh, at any time. We've seen flipped classrooms. That was a new thing, uh, in, certainly in the United States, and, and we've experimented with this. I very quickly went away from that because I realized that people were not actually watching the videos in advance. So we still ended up doing the same. We've seen the advent of massive online learning courses or MOOCs. And now we're in this stage where we see emphasis on interactive learning, where you're really getting people to think about the material just in time when you're in the room. And, you know, I've used that for uh, always in, in my teaching. And I'm still, I have to say, a Blackboard teacher because I like writing things out and thinking about it as you go along. Students can then also see all my mistakes and know that it is very natural to make mistakes even when you're, when you're the teacher. One of the other things that I've seen in changes in education is that there is increased reliance on metrics at universities. So test scores of students, GPA, students are really obsessed with them also, which was a little bit different, I think, when we were students. But also on the other side, teaching evaluations, and they're really difficult to do well. Um, and on the research side, of course, we see these metrics, metrics, um, metrics like uh, citation indices, which I really dislike as a way to measure success because they can be played and, uh, and they can be catered to. And I don't think that's what you want in, in a research environment and, and funding and lots of compliance issues. So there's been lots of changes in ed the educational system as a result. And I think that people that start in that system now experience much more stress as a, as a consequence of all of this. But my main concern is really that I've seen over the decades an increased stress among students. And I know there's students here and we all care about students. Students are, students are the bread and butter of any university. That's why we are here for the students. So I want to think a lot about this a little. So one of the things that I've seen over the last 20 years or so that the fear of failure is increasing quite fast. So students are finding it harder and harder to deal with ambiguity and to deal with uncertainty. Uh, they come in thinking there is a right answer to everything. And they come in thinking that they will be able to find that answer uh, almost directly so that you can get yourself on the right path right from the get-go and get to the answer. And one of the reasons is the way that we educate students, of course, is that we've removed ambiguity and uncertainty from our preparatory coursework in high school and also in undergrad studies. And by the time you get to research, you realize all research is ambiguous, all research is uncertain, and it's very, very hard for students to make that adjustment. So as a result of all of this also, we see imposter phenomenon that we talked about earlier really being rife. So it's everywhere. And a lot of the students feel that they're constantly being judged and that really hampers their joy in learning. So they constantly feel that every single test they make is a make or break um, test. So this is maybe how the students see faculty at a university, <laughs> that we're the, the judge. <laughs> the judge and the and the rulers but you know i wanted to also say that this is really how we see ourselves you know as 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 helping out and and ultimately that is our role as educators is to be there for you and to help you and not judge you but to help you along so here are some some thoughts um about failure uh one thought is that an expert, if you want to be an expert on anything, is really somebody who's made every possible mistake. So keep that in mind. If you don't fail, 
you don't learn. That is the growth mindset that's so important. And my very favorite book of all time is about that. It's called Mindset by Carol Dweck here. And for all of you who would like to have a copy of this book, I'll offer you here now, send me an email and I will send it to you. So send me an email with your address and I'll send you a copy of this book written by a colleague of mine about the growth mindset, which is all about making mistakes to learn, which is enjoyable, super fun and necessary. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the wonderful thing about learning, which we're all doing every day at the university, you know, what an amazing place to be at the university. I feel so, so lucky every day is that every day you get more questions than answers. And, you know, that can also be a little bit nerve wracking because this is how this goes, right? So over time you learn stuff. So here that's the yellow stuff, you know, you know, goes up. So that's nice. But at the same time, because you're exposed to so much around you uh, and, and especially now, I used to have to go to read an encyclopedia to figure th things out, but now everything is at my fingertips. The stuff you know you don't know, you know you don't understand, grows even faster. So over time, there's a bigger and bigger difference between them. And that can feel really bad. And a lot of the students say that gap is so big. That's why I don't belong and I don't have what it takes. Well, guess what? You know, everybody's on the yellow curve. There's nobody on the red curve. So as a result of all of this also, I've seen an increasing reluctance to explore and people are looking for an optimal path also through their studies. They try to optimize what courses to take, in what order, what company to go to. And sometimes people ask me, but Marco, how did you end up at Stanford? Well, I tell you, it was purely by luck. So this, you know, where you are now and where you want to be and having that nice, smooth, linear path in between uh, that, that gives you enrichment and success, that is just not going to happen. Now, it looks maybe more like this. So this is my artistic impression of what, <laughs> of what it may look like. And this is much more fun. Or it may look like this, as in my case, that I was going for one and I ended up somewhere totally different. And for many people, it looks a bit like this, where you never actually reach your goal. But it's just totally fine. So you cannot optimize life. And you have to enjoy the exploration and the learning and explore. And, you know, Obama made this wonderful quote in 2015 that I've been carrying around uh, all this time, where I think he's really right, that the purpose of college for all of us, for professors as well as students, is not just to transmit skills or to learn skills, but to widen the horizon, to explore, to become a better citizen, etc. So keep that in mind as you go along as well. So we see, um, you know, what, the story that I've painted to you today in those 40 years is a story of change, of faster and faster developments in everything, faster computers, more hardware, differences all the time, new things to explore, new information available to us faster and faster at our fingertips in instantly right it's wonderful to have a little phone or a computer where you can look up everything but it also means that you have this feeling that you can never keep up and when you go into industry or when you add in academics you need to somehow find your way through this ever-changing world so it's become unbelievably important i think for people to be agile so agility the 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 uh possibility of the the uh, the talent or the the skill that you have to change and adapt rapidly i've certainly done this in my career going from from area to area and i think to become agile apart from uh, not being too afraid to make a mistake because if you're very afraid of failure you're not going to dive into new things you want to keep to the old you need very strong and broad foundations so one of the things i want to urge you is to really work on your foundational skills your math skills for those of you in in stem your your coding skills and it doesn't matter so much in what language you code in, and it doesn't maybe even matter so much what kind of mathematics you study just as long as you practice this and keep going, because then it will be possible for you to quickly pick up new things. A zest for learning, low risk aversion, just jump in, don't be too scared, um, and all these other good things. But really um, be a bit more holistic 
and not be so ballistic as we say there's so many students and faculty who are very narrowly focused to say this is where i want to go this is going to mean success to me this is where i need to end up and they find it very hard to be open to other opportunities and to learn about everything around us and to really become a great contributor to the big system now, I did, and I also just at the very end want to just acknowledge that this has been a very tough year for everybody. It has uh, offered me the opportunity to be here with you in such an easy way without a jet lag. But we all miss connections. And one of the things that I've noticed in my students a lot and also in my colleagues, that it is really difficult to be in isolation because having others around is really a wonderful way not to just get new ideas, but also to help put things in perspective. So if you ever feel stressed, you know, before COVID, you could just talk to your office mate or walk around to the coffee shop and meet somebody and say, oh, you know, I'm so stressed about this. And the person would say, so am I, but you know what, it's going to be okay. We're me really missing that right now. So it's been a pleasure to be with you here today and we'll see if we have time for some more questions. I've had 40 tumultuous and exciting years <laughs> in STEM. And I just wanted to also say, here is my email address and feel free to send me any thoughts or questions. Happy to chat with you after this talk as well. So please feel free to email. Uh, I'm Marco Gerson, this is my email and thank you for joining us today. Marco, thank you very much. That was really an inspiring discussion with you. And we got so many questions. One of the key questions from the student was, uh, what is the difference between Stanford and Stuttgart? Of course, the first letter is the same, S and S, but there are big differences. The uh, first two letters are the same. <laughs> yeah, of course, sorry, I've forgotten to, to check this. But we will come to this uh, in a chat later on. And uh, thank you very much for this very nice, inspiring discussion that we have had. And I would like to thank you and best greetings to the West Coast, in this case, to Oregon, to a beautiful place. I know this very well. And I would like to thank all the participants too. We got so many extremely good questions and we haven't had enough time to give you all the answers. Uh, but I hope you get, we have got an impression how important it is to bridge the gap between different disciplines and, very important, it's not necessary to go straight forward from one to another point. <laughs> yeah, right. I know this very well. Okay, take care and I hope we will see us as soon as possible face to face uh, in Europe or uh, in the United States. Thanks a lot, Margot. I hope so too. And any questions that were not answered, feel free again to send this to me. Margo, that is really confidential. Answer. You will get a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That's totally fine. I'll be happy to. Okay. Then I would like to thank, I did it, but I would like to thank the audience again, uh, Tom, Wolfram, um, uh, Achim, and um, of course the whole team here, um, especially the team, Tina and uh, all the colleagues and supporters. Then the University Communication Center, they have done a lot of work to handle this and to develop this kind of structure. And um, I would like to say I have had a lot of fun. I was a little bit nervous, you can trust me. I have checked it yesterday evening with Heute Journal. I have uh, had the feeling, uh, can I do it like uh, uh, Klaus Kleber or so on. I have used the same um, color of shirt, but that was the only... Uh, um, Think that I've learned from him. But I hope you have had a little bit fun. If you have any comments about the format, if we can do better things, that was the first way, the first step to get you in interaction with us related to this kind of very nice and very important questions. I wish you a beautiful evening. Enjoy your time and um, try to be to support our university, not on our campus, I hope worldwide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot.